Good morning and welcome to the worship of God with the Congregational Church of Batavia. As we like to say, whenever we gather together, no matter who you are and no matter where you are on life's journey, you're always welcome here. And we really mean that. We're so glad that you've taken time on what is a gray and cold and rainy day to come and be part of worship with us. And whether you're here in person or checking in with us later online in the week, we are so glad that you are part of our worshiping community. The first announcement this morning is that there's an error in the bulletin, one that I feel really terrible about. Our wonderful family helping us with the Advent wreath this morning are the McDonald's, not the McConnell's. This is a classic example of my fat fingering when I type. Um, I'm notorious for it, and if you doubt that, just text me sometime, and you'll see. But thank you very much for being part of our worship this morning. We really appreciate you. I also wanted to let you know that I was made aware yesterday morning that someone has been sending out emails to folks in my contact list in my name and in the name of the church, asking to be in touch with you. There's something urgent they need to talk to you about. What they're trying to do is get money. This is not me. This is spam. I will never ask you for money or for gift cards through an email. If you ever get an email from me and it's even the slightest bit suspicious, just be in touch with me and we can clear it up. But if you got one of those, my deep apologies, and please feel free to just delete it. This afternoon, Acapelago will be performing their Christmas concert here at 4 p.m. If you haven't already gotten your tickets, they're $15 and still available at the door, Vicki? They're 17. They're 17. Oh, I'm sorry. 17 and still available at the door, but I've heard that it's a lovely concert and I'm looking forward to it and you are invited. 15 for seniors. All righty. Next Sunday, December 12th, the Batavia Ministerial Association is sponsoring a community Christmas event at the Peg Bond Center at 5 p.m. We're going to gather together and we're going to hear the Christmas story and sing from some of our favorite carols. We're going to light luminaries in the darkness and we're going to be together with other churches in our community to celebrate the sacred season. Plus there will be popcorn and hot cider available. I'll be there reading the scripture and you are invited to come and be a part of our community celebration of the holiday. Tuesday, December 21st, at 6.30 p.m., we will be having a longest night of the year service here at the church. For those of you who aren't familiar with this, this is a service which is usually held on the winter solstice, which is actually the longest night of the year. For those of us for whom this is not necessarily a season of cheer and joy, the holidays for a lot of folks bring up grief and pain and anxiety, and we take time that night set aside to deal with that. There will be scripture, prayer, and a lot of silence in which we can gather together and bring all of our burdens to God, and you are invited to be a part of that. Because it's not too early to put it in your calendar, Christmas Eve, we will have worship services with singing, candle lighting, and communion at 3, 7, and 11, with an online option for those who are unable to attend. So I hope that covers all of the ground and everybody finds a way to be able to participate in worship. In the next couple of days, you should receive a letter in the mail announcing the official start of our annual stewardship campaign. We're a little bit late this year, but not too much, and our official theme is a new season. And we are asking for your financial assistance as we step into the plan God has for our mission and ministry in the year to come. So please take some prayerful time to fill out your pledge cards so that we can envision the year that God has for us. Don't forget, you can still give to one of the agencies that was highlighted as part of our Christmas gift festival throughout the month of December. Um, Bob Huxtable, uh, representative of outreach, is going to be down outside of Paxson Hall if you're interested in that to talk to, that, talk to him about that. And finally, I want to ask that we hold the Thielen family in our prayers as they grieve the loss of Cal this week. Arrangements are being made for a memorial service after the holidays, and we'll make sure to have more information to you about that. But in the meantime, please just pray for Helen and the rest of Cal's family at this time of loss and grief. Now, as we prepare for worship, you are invited to breathe deeply, to leave aside all of the hustle and hurry that's happening this season, and prepare yourselves for worship as we listen to the prelude.
During this Advent season, we are beginning worship with the word of the prophet. Today, it comes from Malachi 3, 1 through 4. See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and like silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. I invite Vicki to come forward. Our theme, of course, for this Advent is Do You Hear What I Hear? And each week we are singing another verse of that classic carol. So I invite you to stand as you are able as Vicki leads us in the second verse of Do You Hear What I Hear? You may be seated, unless you are the McDonald family, and I'll invite you to come forward because it's time to light our Advent candles for the day. Sunday we lit a candle and we were asked, do you see what I see? We saw darkness, but also a growing light. Today, as we light the second candle of Advent, we are asked, do you hear what I hear? What do we hear this time of year? Noise, so much noise, so much racket, so much hubbub. As everyone tries to get our attention, as every store tries to sell us something, as our own minds buzz with sound. But just beneath all the clamor, a familiar, simple song rings through. Joy to the world. It gets a little louder every day as more vo voices join. Our voices join in. Joy indeed, for God has chosen to come near, to stand beside us and journey with us. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is number 240, if you want to follow along in your hymnals of the Father's love begotten, one of my favorites for this time of year. It's solemn, but it's so wonderful. So I invite you to stand as you're able.
This is the day that our God has made and given to us as a gift. So you are invited to greet those around you in a socially acceptable manner in the middle of a pandemic with love and grace. One of the things our fabulous Miss Laura is doing with our Sunday school this year is each month they're learning and engaging in a new prayer practice, a new way to pray and to understand what it is to be in relationship with God. And the beginning of each month, Laura comes and shares that with us too. So I'd like to invite her to come forward now and let us know what the kids will be up to this December. And the good news is the prayer practice isn't just for the kids. <laughs> All of you can participate in the prayer practices each month. And being that we are in the season of Advent, this month our prayer practice is focusing on Advent devotionals. Um, and so one of the things that we did last week at the Advent workshop was we began to create our own Advent wreaths using just paper, and something to color with, and some tape or some glue. And we have packets of these um, downstairs outside of Paxton Hall. And every family, every member of the congregation, we encourage you to take one home. Each week, you have a different candle to color, whether it's hope, peace, joy, or love. There's one for Christmas Day. And then there's a little Advent wreath that you can attach your candles to each week. It also comes with a weekly prayer. And my encouragement is for you guys to do a weekly Advent devotion. Um, and you can do this on Sunday. You can do this on Tuesday morning at breakfast, if that's what works for your family, or Thursday after dinner. Um, every family is going to have a different time to do that. These prayers are brief, but they really reflect on the week's themes. The other thing that we have available, too, is this wonderful Advent devotional booklet that was put together um, with offerings from different people in our congregation, different pictures, different poems, different thoughts. And thank you, Susan, for, Susan Price, for putting it all together for us. Um, there's so much going on in the month of December and preparing for Christmas. But there's so much to be learned from these weeks of Advent and you know, the, the, our, our hope and our peace, the joy and the love that we focus on each week. And if we take time each week to focus on that and think about that, it can give us a whole new experience for our Christmas celebrations. And again, um, the Advent devotional booklets and the Advent wreath are outside of Paxton Hall on a small table there. Thank you. Okay, the coloring uh, sheets are really fun. They're not just for kids. It's really zen. To sit down and, and color takes you back to your childhood and it centers you. So it's delightful. I'd invite you to grab one of those. And now as our children are heading out for Sunday school with Miss Laura, Vicki will lead us in our prayer as we sing them out. Go now in peace, go now in peace. May the love of God surround you everywhere, everywhere you may go. During the time of our stewardship campaign, we're going to take just a moment for a stewardship moment. And usually when that happens, you hear from someone other than the pastor. Because at least in part, you all know already what I'm going to say. Give, pledge, support, yada, 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 right? You've heard it all before from the pastor. But this time, I thought I'd speak for just a minute because unless you were on the search committee, you may not know about the journey that I took to find you. And a journey it was. 
I had been the associate pastor at a nearby congregation for just about six years when I felt that God was calling me to a new ministry. So I put my profile together and I began to look. And I looked at literally hundreds of churches who were looking for a pastor. Big ones, small ones, in between, pretty much everything. And I interviewed with plenty of those churches too. Good churches doing really good work in their neighborhoods. And to be perfectly honest, not to brag, a lot of them were interested in me. But none of them felt like the right fit. I kept feeling that God was calling me into something else. And so I kept looking. And then I found the Congregational Church of Batavia. I found you guys. It's not just one thing that made this place feel like home to me. It was many things, including some of those intangibles that are really hard to put into words. But something that impressed me right off the bat about this congregation was this. CCOB had gone through some really hard times over the past handful of years, situations that definitely took their toll. And in the midst of all of that, in what made plenty of other churches in similar circumstances kind of curl in on themselves and focus on their own issues, CCOB chose to double down on its commitment to reaching out to their neighbors, to their world, with love and with grace. I was especially struck by the activities of your outreach and justice and witness teams, two arms of love that reach out in totally different ways to reach the world. Not every church has teams like this, actually, and it was wonderful to me to see the ways in which these two teams were working in this congregation and in this neighborhood. And I wanted to be a part of a church with that kind of resilience, with that kind of spirit, with that kind of call to make their world a better place. I wanted to be a part of what you're doing here now. So that's why I'm here. That's why I answered the call. That's why I joined the church. That's why I got installed here just a little while ago. And that's why I'm gonna fill out my pledge card because I believe in who you are and what you're doing. And I believe that God has great things for you. And I wanna be a part of that. Amen. We are especially blessed today with some special music by Griffin, who's here to play the cello for us. And we are giving thanks for that special music in this holiday season.
Thank you. As we enter into the time when we're going to hear the gospel, I invite you to join me in our unison prayer of illumination. God who waits with us and who also waits for us. In this season of anticipation, open our ears, open our minds, open our hearts so that we can truly hear the still small urging of your spirit the cries of our neighbors in need in our own authentic voice. Because in hearing, we take a step toward wholeness. We ask now that as we prepare to hear your word, that you instill in us the kind of hope the first hearers knew, a hope that is fierce, a hope that is living, a hope that is active, a hope that can carry us when we need it most. We ask this in the name of your word made flesh. Amen. Amen. Our gospel reading for this, the second Sunday of Advent, comes from the gospel according to Luke, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. I invite you to hear these words. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip ruler of the region of Iterea and Trachonitis, and Licinius ruler of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his path. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Here ends the reading of the word. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please join me in just a moment of prayer. Holy One, we hear in this story today of your word coming to John in the wilderness. We ask that once again, you will send your word for us, that we may hear it and that it may take root in our hearts and grow there. We ask this all in the name of your word made flesh, Jesus Christ, amen. So I was surfing the radio dial the day after Halloween this year looking for something to keep me company in the car while I was running my weekly errands, when the dulcet tones of Bing Crosby's White Christmas came wafting out of the car speakers. I looked down at the dashboard display to see what station I had stumbled upon, and sure enough, it was 93.9, the light FM. Now each year, right around the holidays, the light switches to an all Christmas music format, which is kind of fun in the heart of December, when the temperatures are beginning to drop and the snow starts to fall and folks put up their Christmas lights, but which seemed really dissonant to me this year as I drove with my window down, mind you, past houses that still had their jack-o'-lanterns on the front porches and Halloween skeletons posed on their lawns. It seemed just a touch early. Still, there it was, as clear as a bell on Christmas Day. Bing Crosby and Mariah Carey and Nat King Cole and Amy Grant all alerting to me by way of classic Christmas tunes that the holidays were already well on their way whether I was prepared for it or not. What we hear this time of year is such a central part of our Christmas experience. There's a definite soundtrack to the season and when we hear it, we know that it's time to prepare. We hear its music when we turn on the TV, on our favorite shows and on commercials alike. We hear it in the stores we frequent for our weekly chores and our holiday shopping. And we hear it on the radio, whether we listen to 93.9 or other stations. They all eventually get in on the act. Do you hear what I hear? The music of Christmas is everywhere, especially in our homes. 
I've noticed over the years that each family and each individual actually seems to have their own unique soundtrack that accompanies them with their holiday preparations. Very specific artists and albums that folks like to listen to as they are doing particularly Christmassy things like decorating the tree or wrapping presents or baking cookies. Growing up, the Wolfanger family soundtrack included holiday albums from Kenny Rogers, the Statler Brothers, and the Oak Ridge Boys, which was really weird because we never listened to country music any other time of the year. <laughs> Go figure. These days, when I need some holiday cheer to accompany me as I prepare for the season, I turn to Snow Angels, an album by Over the Rhine, or the Indigo Girls holiday offering, Holly Happy Days. They're both fantastic collections of traditional carols and songs, as well as original music. And if you happen to wander by my office during Advent, you will definitely hear one of those playing on my computer if you were to stick your head in. Yes, every family and individual has their own unique Christmas soundtrack that accompanies their preparations. And I would love to hear what your favorites are in the days that come. So shoot me an email with your playlist and I'll give it a listen. This second Sunday of Advent, I want to ask you, do you hear what I hear? Because this day in our liturgical calendar also has its own soundtrack to accompany our increasingly frenzied holiday preparations. And inevitably, that soundtrack is the voice of John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, and the one who cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. There's a lot happening here in these six short verses near the beginning of the gospel according to Luke. A lot that we could choose to explore from a discussion of what the author means when he describes John's ministry as a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Repentance is one of those tricky theological words that is fun to explore. But we could also dive into his use of the words of the prophet Isaiah in their original context as a prophecy of hope for the Jewish people in the midst of the Babylonian exile. I can realistically see at least four solid sermons arising from this one text, or one incredibly long one. But as today is a communion Sunday, we're not going to go there. No. The thing that really interested me as I read this passage this time around was the very beginning of it, the part that we usually skip over because it has all of those really hard to pronounce names. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip ruler of the region of Iterea and Trachonitis, and Licinius ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Je Zechariah, in the wilderness. Luke, ever the rigorous historian, at least by the standards of his time, goes out of his way to meticulously place John in the timeline, in the history of his people, and of the larger world by clearly naming the governmental and religious powers who were leading when John began his ministry. Like a film director who's kind of slowly zooming in on a globe or a map so that you can get the context, Luke starts with the big picture, the entire empire of Rome and its leader, Emperor Tiberius. He then begins to narrow his focus just a little bit, bringing us closer and closer to his intended goal. There's Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, and then another level in, Herod and his brothers with their particular territories, which include, of course, Galilee, which will become important later in the gospel. And finally, as we're brought in even more closely, there are Annas and Caiaphas, the high priests of the great temple in Jerusalem. All of those listed here by Luke are powerful, important men, men whose names history will remember for better or for worse. They are the ones whose decisions and proclamations and even whims will shape the lives of literally millions of men, women, and children who live under their governance and authority. But defying expectation and convention, this story is not about any of them. It's about the word of God 
coming to John, a relative nobody, someone with no power, no wealth, no education, no authority to recommend him. John, the son of the humble priest Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. John, the local weirdo who lived way off the beaten path in the desert, dressed in stinking camel skins and survived on a diet of locusts and wild honey. He didn't have a platform. He didn't have a microphone. He didn't have a ready-made audience of fans that were hanging on his every word. He is literally the last guy I would have chosen if I had an important message to get to a large audience. Nevertheless, the story of the public ministry of Jesus of Nazareth begins right here when the word of God comes to John in the wilderness. I guess this shouldn't surprise us too terribly much by now. If we look at the history of the word of God, the power of God coming to people in the Hebrew Bible, we will find that God consistently chooses a whole lot of nobodies. Noah, Abraham and Sarah, Joseph, David, even Isaiah himself. We know their names now, of course, because of the role they played in the story God was writing in the world. But at the time that God spoke to them, they were as powerless, as marginal, as anonymous as was John. Even the sacred story that most captures our hearts and our imaginations this time of year the story of the birth of Jesus Christ, which we will hear again in its entirety on Christmas Eve, is the story of people that are utterly powerless. A poor, unwed, pregnant teenager, her betrayed, confused, working-class fiancé, and an unidentified group of tired, ragged, and frankly somewhat spurious shepherds. They are the ones that God chose. They are the ones who received the divine word. They are the ones who were entrusted with the precious, powerful, priceless message from the creator of the universe that love itself was on its way. It's almost as if God is trying to convey something in the very choice of messenger itself. Maybe that the realm of God does not reside with the powerful structures and people of this world, but rather with the lowly and the outcast. Imagine if we were to take that seriously. That said, an interesting truth suggests itself as we read this passage once again on this, the second Sunday of Advent. And it's this. Who are the powerless, the lowly, the nobodies that the word of God has come to in our time and place to speak to us? Who are the prophets that are trying, like John, to get our attention, to tell us that God has drawn nigh? Who are the folks that are calling to us to prepare the way of the Lord right now? And perhaps even more importantly, are we even really listening for their voices? The scripture passage today reminds us that God has chosen throughout history to speak from the margins. Our culture tells us that we must give our attention to and throw our support behind those in power, whether they be in government, in entertainment, in religion, or simply those with a lot of money and power. But God, God has chosen a different way to communicate with us, to draw near. So who are they? Who are our John the Baptists, our prophets that are crying out in the wilderness? A few thoughts occurred to me as I was thinking about that this week. Maybe they're the folks who are speaking out on behalf of our planet. Those voices that proclaim the inconvenient truth that a feet of glacier are melting every year and sea levels are rising and rainforests are disappearing and entire species are on the endangered list. Reminding us that we are the only ones who can actually do anything about this. Maybe these are the prophets of our time. Perhaps they're the folks that are fleeing their countries due to violence and famine and economic collapse. Places like Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan, South Sudan, and Myanmar, which as of July this year topped the list of places where global refugees come from. They remind us that one of the most fundamental commandments of the Hebrew people was to care for aliens in their midst. And that Jesus himself summed up the entire law in the words, love your neighbor 
as yourself. Maybe these are the prophets of our time. Then there are those who raise their voices to demand that white America take responsibility for its history of racial oppression and injustice, a history that has very real cultural, economic, and political ramifications in our time. Whether it's the long shadow thrown by America's legacy of African-American slavery or the colonization of Native America, the voices that call us to racial account are perhaps the prophets of our time. And this week, once again, sadly, gun violence erupted, this time at Oxford High School in Oxford, Michigan, leaving four dead and seven injured. It's the 28th school shooting in 2021. And once again, our children have raised their voices saying, we do not want to be gun fodder. They are literally, openly, desperately asking us to do something to protect them. And they are, without a doubt, the prophets of our time. Do you hear what I hear? The voice of ones calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Are we listening, friends, to the least, the last, the lost? Because these are the ones to whom the word of the Lord has come, as the word of the Lord has always come. Do you hear what I hear? We in the United Church of Christ have a saying that we like to use to describe this reality, and it goes like this. God is still speaking. God is still speaking. And in fact, we like that and we believe that so much that it's become something of a motto for our denomination. We put it on everything from t-shirts to bumper stickers to websites to the official UCC planning calendar that gets mailed out to all the pastors and staff in United Church of Christ churches. We believe that just as the word of God came to John in the wilderness, just as it came to Zechariah and to Elizabeth and to Mary and to Joseph and to the ragged band of shepherds on the hillside, the word of God is still alive and well and speaking to us through modern prophets. And the message that is much the same as it was 2,000 years ago when Luke was writing much as it was 600 years before that when the prophet Isaiah first spoke them. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth. And all flesh shall see salvation together. God is drawing near. Salvation is drawing near. As we talked about last week, the realm of God is drawing near, and we need to prepare. There is work to be done. The work of justice, the work of equality, the work of liberation, the work of welcome, the work of peacemaking, the work of putting flesh and blood on God's love for all people. Do you hear what I hear? God is still speaking to us from the margins through modern-day prophets, calling us to faith and to action. For the still-speaking voice of God, we give thanks today, and for the grace to listen with humility. Thanks be to God. Amen. In just a moment, we will celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion, a reminder that this table does not belong to any pastor, any church, any denomination, but rather instead it belongs to Jesus Christ who invited all of us to come to the table if we were seeking the love of God. So as always, no matter who you are, no matter where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here and you are invited to participate. What we have been doing during the pandemic is allowing people to get the elements themselves. So we have specially individually packaged bread up here and cups of juice. It is juice, not wine. And we have gluten-free all the way over in the corner here if that is something that you need. When the time comes, you'll be invited to come down through the center aisle, come to either side, take a bread, take a juice, and return to your seats where we will eat the bread and drink the juice together. May you know that the God of comfort is with you. May you see the God of comfort with you. 
Open wide your anxious hearts. Let us give thanks and share our joy. The dawn of hope rests on the horizon. The beams of love reach our doubting hearts. We celebrate the newness of this season, waiting to see how the Christ will appear in our world. Even in our despair, a glimmer of hope reaches into our twilight, beckoning us to breathe and to wait. Our story tells us that the Christ child whose birth we anticipate will one day sit at tables with strangers and friends, building relationships filled with love and grace. We see this as he fed the multitude, later turned water into wine, and ate with dear ones the night before his death. He took the bread, blessed it, and broke it. Eat this in remembrance of me, he said. He took the cup. And in his blessing, he reminded them that though when they sipped from the fruit of the vine to drink in remembrance of him, Jesus, the Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, light of the world, the word of life, no matter how we know him and or what name we choose to call him, he is our hope, our peace, our joy, and our love. May the Spirit bless us and these elements as we commune to remember him. Come now, for all things are ready. This bread which we eat is the body of Christ, and it is a reminder that in Christ all broken things are made whole. Take and eat. This is the cup of blessing which is poured out for everyone. Take and drink and be blessed. We have been fed at the table. We are in the presence of the divine. If your heart is willing, please join me in our prayer of thanksgiving. For the nourishment of spirit, mind, and body, for hope that we begin to see, and for comfort from the Prince of Peace, we share our gratitude, gracious God. Encourage us in these shortened days, through the long nights of this season, May your hope carry us until dawn arrives again. Amen. As I was noting during announcements that there's a lot going on in our community and in the world right now, and it's not always a time of great joy and merriment for everyone. And so we take a moment to remember those in our congregation, in our community, in our midst that we love. We continue to pray for Ruthie, Becky Hall's mom. We ask that God will be with Bob Van Dam. We hold before God Bill Price. We ask that God will continue to be with Katie Jones and give her strength so that she can come home soon. We ask that God will be on this journey with Jamie Bridger. We continue to ask for prayer and grace for Marsha Lythrop. Pray for comfort for the Alexander family. We ask for healing for Karen Kosky. Today we remember the Thielen family in our prayers. And we pray for Amy Thompson, who was taken to the hospital with COVID and pneumonia this week. So we hold her in our thoughts and prayers. And we think of the people of Oxford, Michigan today, and the grief and the fear that they must be carrying. If your heart is willing, please join me in prayer. Oh, 
Holy One, everything this time of year is telling us that we have to be joyful, we have to be merry, we have to be upbeat, we have to want to be around people and do all of these holiday things. And yet for many of us, there are moments when it's just too much. We thank you that we have the opportunity and the time to come here to this space where we can simply let our spirits be, that we can carry in with us anything that might be there, and that we can leave it in your hands because we know there's no safer place for it to be. We thank you for the members of our community and for the love and grace that they have for each other and for the world. We thank you that in prayer we can bring our concerns and our joys to you. We thank you that you choose to be in relationship with us. As we gather together today, we raise the names that we know so well on our prayer, prayer list. We ask that you'll be with Ruthie and with Bob. We hold before you Bill and Katie. We ask that you'll be with Jamie and Marsha. Please be with the Alexander family during this time and bring healing to Karen Kosky. Hold close the Thelans, be with Amy, and we ask that you be with the people of Oxford right now. We also know that there are concerns in our hearts and worries on our minds that we have not spoken out loud, and we turn those over to you as well. Give us ears to hear this season. Help us to hear the prophets in our midst. Help us to hear your still small voice Help us to hear our own authentic voices when they tell us what we need, that we need to slow down, to be silent, to be still, to wait for you. Strengthen us in the week to come. Give us the grace to reach out with love and grace. Remind us always, always that you travel with us. We ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ and it's his family prayer that we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is It Came Upon the Midnight Clear. You can find that on 251 in your hymnals if you'd like to follow along. I invite you to stand as you are able.
Friends, hear the good news. During the presidency of Joe Biden, and when J.B. Pritzker was governor of Illinois, and Schilke was the mayor of Batavia, and Molly Carlson was the minister of the Illinois Conference, the word of God came to us at the Congregational Church of Batavia. And we are empowered and filled with great joy because of it. Go forth today and shine. You may be seated for our prelude.